So, I have a quick question for you. What is the first anime you ever watched? A lot of you are gonna say something like Pokemon or Yu-Gi-Oh, but that's not what I mean. I'm talking about that series where you knew it wasn't a cartoon. Something about it telling you that it was different, but you didn't know why. This is more for the ones around my age where we were exposed to anime through cable TV. Accidentally leaving it on and finding Inuyasha, or seeing Toonami start up after school. It's where most found the answer to my question. But not me. Being the youngest of three, my parents were very protective and heavily limited TV. Like, they didn't even let me watch Samurai Jack to get the idea across. I did catch some SD Gundam and if I was lucky, an episode of DVZ when I was at my neighbor's place. But most of the series from the era I missed out on. Luckily, a few years later I would find my answer with a series about a young, loud blonde boy, yeah, Naruto, as well as another one that came out that year. Zatch Bell. While I have a massive soft spot for the former, I've surprisingly revisited the latter throughout my entire life. At no point my thoughts diminishing, only ever increasing. It has fallen into obscurity, but ask anyone who's into it and their passion will immediately show, giving it this cult classic status. And that's always annoyed me since despite the silly look, there is a lot going on here, from its combat, visuals, and story. So now that I've made my way through the anime and manga, we're finally gonna give it its time in the spotlight. So get comfy, cause this one has been a long time coming. But for the uninitiated, what exactly is Zatch Bell? Funny enough, to answer this question, we're gonna have to shift focus to Kiyomaru, a teenage genius who's isolated himself from the world due to him being superior to his peers. No longer going to school since he can easily pass, with the students and teachers hating him for it. Until one day, because of his father, gets stuck looking after Zatch, a strange blonde child with him a red book with unknown characters. That one red makes him shoot lightning from his mouth with insane power. What is he? Why a book and where did he come from? This would start to get answered when they get attacked by a pair like them. That when their book gets burned from the battle, the child desperately tries to stop it until he just fades from existence. Right after being revealed that a hundred demon children were sent to this world in a competition to decide the next king of their realm. The winner being the last one standing. And yes, it is exactly what it sounds like, a battle royale. Which doesn't seem special now since it's become a popular subgenre across many forms of media. But for context, Zatch Bell made its chapter debut in Weekly Shonen Sunday on January 10th, 2001. Not only predating the boom by 15 years, but coming out less than a month after the titular Japanese film that directly influenced that cultural shift. Meaning that Makoto Raiku couldn't have been inspired by it since the contents of the manga were too well thought out to have been rushed in such a short window. I'm getting a little ahead of myself, so the easiest way to show this is by talking about the books and how they heavily change combat. When a demon is sent to our world, all the powers they had prior are locked away in it, and the only way to get access to them is by finding a human partner they internally synergize with them being the ones who decide spells and when to use them. Basically, you no longer have control of your skill set, and must now rely on someone else to do something that is second nature. To put it another way, when a character is fighting, there is an immediacy between strategy and execution. Seeing them try something, the outcome and based on their abilities quickly form their next move. This is something invisible that's in every scuffle that you never think about it, but here the books break that down to its individual components. The opponents attacking, with the bookkeeper having to pick from a selection of abilities to counter with, giving the fights a more turn-based feel. And when you learn that Makoto Raiku's favorite games are Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy, from an interview he did with Anime News Network, that makes a lot of sense. This might come off as just Pokemon with extra steps for some, which I totally get, but based on everything I've said about basic combat, there is a lot more to it. The book forcing the humans to be actively involved. Despite the spells coming from the demons, the strain of it falling on them. A move that is nothing for one, being killer for the other since their body is not used to it. Limiting fights so they never drag on since there is a very finite resource while adding a whole other element of strategy. 
Burning the book is the only way to remove someone from competition, creating two combat approaches. The first being your traditional shonen battles, where the demons just go head to head until one eventually falls, leaving the bookkeeper completely defenseless. Or you can just ignore the demon outright and aim straight for them, the attacks being very powerful by default due to the demons having a strong endurance and healing factor. And while they can take it, that can't be said for the other party. They're just regular humans, so they easily get destroyed in comparison. On top of the toll of using the books, the encounters have this level of brutality that feels more of what you'd see at the end of a series like this. This may all sound really complicated, but trust me when I say it isn't. So much so that it's all shown in two chapters, allowing you to enjoy the playground that is Raikou's meta, from the demon's abilities that vary drastically being physical or actual spells or how they use the setting, like an opponent tricking them into a forest slowly mentally and physically exhausting Kyo, to a standard one-on-one -on -one that it never gets old seeing Zatch and Kyo think their way out of each scenario. A great showcase of this is the very early fight with Fane, an air-based demon who our duo can't hit since he's naturally fast. So Kyo, cornering himself on the roof, uses his shield spell to block the incoming attack, something that Fane easily jumps over only to have Zakir locked and loaded on the other side, caging him mid-air. And these are just super tiny samples of what to expect with both forms of attack that the encounters always feel fresh, and this isn't even getting to the high level where the playstyles are being switched mid-combat. You can really feel the love Reku has for the turn-based RPG genre, and with how he combines it with Battle Shonen, it's why I keep coming back. Demons being transported to Earth gives a great excuse as to why the powers exist while streamlining the contents of the series. The scale being very tiny since there isn't a world to build, and finite since there's only 100 participants, yet still feeling grand because of the global reach of the tournament. That doesn't mean it's non-existent. Thatch having lost his memories at the start gives him and the world a mystique that slowly gets drip-fed as he meets more of his kind, like how he's the weakest from selection, making him the main target for others. Which was a great idea since there's always a fight around the corner while letting us enjoy the wide range of demons Raikou can come up with. Not seeing their world allows him to design them however he wants, which he took great advantage of. Some look human, others animal, to even mixing and matching. Some being very exaggerated, with the more restrained ones still feeling like they don't belong in this realm, like they're clashing with it. His love for character is really apparent, but not just visually, but into how he incorporates it into the story. The goal of the competition isn't just to pick a king, but to shape the contestants through it. Plunging them into the world and stripping them of everything. Powers, friends, knowledge, it forces them out of their comfort zone where they must now rely on someone else. That person internally matching them creating the perfect bond. Making up what the other lacks and through this exposing them to new concepts. It's not about having the best partner or abilities, but about finding the best relationship that will optimize growth for both. That it's only when they're together that the demons become the definitive versions of themselves. The strongest teams being the ones that get the most out of the relationship. That's how they find their beliefs that make them who they are. Like when they meet Kururu, a sweet, peaceful demon who is unluckily chosen forced to bear a violent split personality that she just asks Zatch to burn her book and end her suffering. He's resistant on the idea while Kyo painfully burns it, exposing him to a harsh reality of the world. It's hard moments like these that give him his motivation for winning that he carries all the way till the end turning the battles into these literal clashes of ideology to see whose is actually stronger, which is emphasized even more with how these spells are unlocked, not with training but through those life-defining moments that truly show who you are from either half of the pair. Meaning that the only way to get stronger is by character development. Since it's all based on what the characters are figuring out about themselves, the level of realization equating to the strengths of the spell. The first fight is a great showcase of this. The only reason they win is because of a defensive spell born from Kyo's yearn to protect someone from the prior chapter. Which I really love, since it not only gives the series really tight pacing, as well as a solid excuse for new powers randomly unlocking, it cleverly handicaps stronger demons. 
that due to their way of life back home are much more powerful and would curve stomp everyone. The book's putting everyone at an equal start, locking away their abilities, meaning both camps develop differently. The first externally honing their physical and mental attributes from all the experience and battles in the outside world, while the second being more internal and meditative, one forcing the weaker participants to grow and get stronger and in doing so get new powers, the other making the already strong ones having to earn them by finding what they're missing. And you really see this through Zatch and Brago. Zatch gaining his motivation and actively trying to get stronger to achieve his goal, while Brago, as unbeatable as he is, trying to understand the purpose of pairing with humans. These two are just the many we meet in the series, the development meaning something different for everyone. Let's take Tia for example, a demon that immediately gets betrayed by her only friend at the start of the competition, closing herself off from the others succumbing to the every man for himself mentality. And yet despite her aggressive behavior, her powers say otherwise. Her only attack spell being so weak that its only purpose is for burning books, not actual combat. While her other more defensive ones are unbeatable, that her nature is that of someone who wants to protect, that it isn't until she forms her friendship with Zatch that she starts getting more powerful spells. This is one of my favorite moments in the whole series because you see everything we've talked about. The partner filling in the gap the meaning in the spells to the external experience game. It's not about winning or losing, but about the impact these clashes will have on the participants. Raikou's love for character is so palpable with how he incorporated it into every facet of the series. From the blood, sweat, and tears poured into the spells that they represent everything about the users, that it's no wonder why the fights are so intense and visceral making them tooth and nail struggles for survival, where the cost of losing is also saying goodbye to someone you've grown very close to, that it makes the moments when they have to go hit much harder, which Raikou doesn't pull any punches with. There's never a moment when you meet a pair and it's obvious they're gonna be taken out because the designs never feel lazy, creating that real feeling of death of something being abruptly cut short. And it makes sense with how much thought he put into them, creating some of my favorites of all time just because of how clever they are. Which I know sounds crazy, but bear with me. The demons being the immediate eye candy, with the humans having a more grounded look. As we talked about earlier, being from another world allowed him to do whatever he wanted as well as get past the limitations of Earth, giving them unique features and colors leading to their more exaggerated looks. When you remember that their partners are extensions of who they are, it adds a whole other layer to it because something about them is being represented through each other. Zatch being this friendly child with never-ending energy, that it makes sense his power is electricity. That you can see him as the endless potential Kyo is wasting at the beginning of the story by closing himself off. That it's after he meets him his true, much kinder personality comes out. While he is the knowledge Zatch is missing, that rubs off on him with every battle, electricity being one of the most flexible powers that's being fully utilized when they come together. This synergy being represented visually, with him having a more regal look with the white and gold ribbon contrasting the color of his mantle, that is complementary to Kyo's studious look, yet still feeling childlike with his shoes being folded over, with the energetic yellow being Zatch's hair while the calmer white and blue are on Kyo that create an electric motif down to the green in his mantle. And this is just the main duo. If we go to Tia, it's totally different. Megumi being this huge pop idol that everyone knows, you can see her as this personification of how honest she is to the world. That the pleasant, vibrant appearance that people see on stage isn't a facade, but who she really is. That Tia is her personality. Making it so perfect that when you see her in that life, she's so done with it. So what does the human half say about the other? It's actually quite simple, despite her appearance, she's a normal girl just like her partner. Her outward appearance may say one thing, but unlike Megumi, what's underneath might have a little more of an edge. Lacking the puppet features and giving her an inviting doll-like look. With the long hair and handcrafted details like the frills on her dress, the holes on her shoes, the open pattern on her sleeves, and the angelic neck piece. That feels fragile, especially with the Strawberry Shortcake palette, but it is reversed so hard by them having the ultimate defense, since they have to protect the ones they care about. 
The colors themselves make a healing motif as well as showing parts of her personality, the strong red for her fiery aggressive side with pink being more tender, and with a small splash of orange for a bit of playfulness. Megumi having natural colors like green, yellow, and orange that are complementary to Tia emphasizing her nature even more and being cheerful in its own way. She changes outfits throughout the series so you see different combinations of the colors which is a really nice touch. I'm also bringing this up since there are some that don't abide by this, but I don't think it's a coincidence how often we see this palette. But even when you remove it, like in the cover, just by looking at Tia you immediately know everything about her. And you can see this with every pair, some making complete total sense while they're together, with others being so unexpected, those being my favorites. Since so much is being said, you just don't know how. So let's reverse it here and focus on Brago, and when you see him, you're expecting his partner to have a menacing cold appearance to match his intimidating look. So when you see it's Sherry, a whole other side is being shown and that goes both ways. This logic is applied to every team in the series, creating this really unique Rorschach test where how you view someone changes when you see who they're paired with. And these guys are the outlier coming together because of their hatred, hers for demons and his for humans. She has a lot of anger and he is that monster. Their goal to end the game as fast and take out as many players as possible. They're the extreme, but Raikou always manages to present the humanity in all of his pairings. Brago being this boogeyman that is feared by everyone, so limiting his appearance keeps that idea intact. And yet, when he does, there's always these little moments that really sell you on his relationship with Sherry. Initially bonding from hatred, these private moments convey that it's so much more now. And it's why they're one of my favorite teams because I just love how much they care for each other in their own special way. Which is also a testament to Raikou's character work since Braga doesn't even have a backstory and I genuinely love him. And if you think this is an isolated incident, the number of times he made me feel something for an asshole is annoyingly higher than I want it to be so he's doing something right. If you made it this far into the video, you're prob a little interested in the series, so what's the best way to do so? The quick answer is the manga, because you can really appreciate Raikou Makoto's visual skills. Which is gonna surprise a few since for some, the art of the turnoff. Having a very cartoony style with the big facial features and blocky bodies. Which to the shock of no one, I really love since that means it's simplified and expressive. The emotion of the cast being clear as day in any of the panels, from the intensity of battle to more subtle moments. Just look at this page where even with the context removed, you understand that she's no longer playing around. This readability being crucial to Zatch Bell since you really get a sense of what they're feeling and how much they're feeling it, that I don't think a more conventional style would be able to nail it on this level. The bodies having a solidity due to how simple they are. The posing always has weight and energy to them. The line of action being straight to give it maximum impact. They look unbreakable creating that powerful feel and yet Raikou goes one step further by going against his own logic. Pushing the gestures as far as possible. Curving and stretching them and while it does look silly, it perfectly conveys the intensity of the action that they're being pushed to their limits so much so that it's breaking the rules of the world. His actual art is fantastic, pulling you in with its texture. Even though his characters are simple, everything has so much more detail, creating this stark contrast that really hits, not only in attacks but seeing everyone get shredded apart. When you pair it with his use of scale, it's always a good time. He understands to sell the David vs Goliath element, he needs to emphasize the David and Goliath parts respectively, having the characters tiny with the incoming danger being massive. His detail used to show the destructive power. One of my favorite examples of this is where he uses a page spread to show the far reach of Brago's attack, which already looks insane only to start the next chapter with a whole page dedicated to the depths of the damage. And if this doesn't even hype you up a little for the upcoming battle, I don't know what to tell you. The manga is quite the good time, but there are still some issues with it. The main one for me is the page layouts being pretty weak. 
Raikou sticks heavily to the standard layout. It's gonna sound weird, but I think he puts too much information on the page, having panels that don't add much. Where removing them, our brain perfectly fills in the gap, limiting his layout to even more, which is a shame since his fights are so creative. There's never a moment where it really uses the medium of manga to elevate the story, in a way a good anime adaptation couldn't do better, making the actual anime even more disappointing. Starting in 2003 and running for 150 episodes is very much a product of its time, not getting the time it needs bringing down fantastic material. It has a ton of issues, some being the usual while others being really weird, and since I spent so much time on this, we're gonna go through every single one. First off, it's very low budget, having stilted to downright awful animation, dash lines, cheap effects, and visual errors. It adds very little to the material like new scenes that do flesh out characters better as well as connect events, which is really good but those are few and far between. Outside of that, anything from the manga is basically untouched, creating very bad looking scenes with a ton of negative space. You never see moments reimagined with animation in mind. The art is also a massive downgrade losing Raikou's sharp line work and detail. Nothing has impact, turning these animated images into lifeless animation. All the effects being removed in this scene where he also blends with the background, making it less readable. What even is this one? Like, come on. Aside from the art change, there are many other alterations. The second to last arc being where it wraps, and deviating a lot with the ending being unsatisfying. The visceral element, which is very important, is gone either toning down the visuals, adding new scenes to lessen the impact, or just cutting panels altogether. Like this scene where Brago gets his arm cut off. It's important for many reasons I'm not going to go into because this video is already too long, but I will say by removing it, this entire moment makes no sense. And there are many more like it in the anime. For some reason, they decided to separate these guys, so now his book burns for no reason, breaking the most basic rule of the entire series. In the manga, they're together when the attack lands, so it makes sense. And this is just scratching the surface when it comes to changes that don't make any sense. If you have the power to command ice through a superpowered demon child with a magic book, then why do you need a gun? It makes me feel big. Technically, we're not supposed to be here until chapter 4. Enough. Sadly, the arm wasn't the only thing cut, affecting how I viewed some characters. A lot of the quieter moments between Sherry and Brago got the same treatment which makes me really mad since that's what builds their relationship. One of my fave characters, their entire backstory is completely ruined. There was no reason for this and it makes no sense. There's a ton of padding that ruins the pacing and no, I don't mean filler. I mean that the episodes are just really stretched out, having tons of flashbacks to events that take place in the same episode, having scenes last way too long and reusing them. I have to stress that I have not edited what you're seeing in any way, it's just that long, making it a slog which is a damn shame since the series has great arcs, being broken into four parts. The beginning being random encounters which shape Zatch and his group of friends, who are then tested in the next three arcs. The first being the stone demons where many past contestants who were trapped in stone get freed and are under the control of a single team followed by the Fado arc where a group tries to unleash a powerful force. And lastly, Clear Note, where you meet the final hurdle for the competition and have many of your questions finally answered. If you're one of the many who never picked it up after the anime, trust me, you have to read it, it's awesome. The resolution being a little too anime, but overall it's worth it. The manga being super tight is great, but that creates its own issues. There is very little time to flesh out some of the humans. Kyo and a few others from the latter half are great, but Megumi, Fulgore, and even Li Yen I wish were explored a lot more. It's why I haven't talked about them much since the ones I like I don't want to spoil. If anything, it feels like he noticed this problem and tried to fix it later on. These next ones are a massive pivot and you're gonna understand why I have to preface that. The only dark-skinned character is drawn as a racist caricature, and it is as direct as it sounds. The demons being kids was a good idea, but it makes certain things very weird. Zatch gets completely nude, and I mean where you see everything. It doesn't happen often, but even one time is way too many, and the anime plays it up way more for some reason. 
There is a perv character who's later introduced, and don't get the wrong idea, I love perv characters, I find them funny. But typically, their focus is on a much older age range. You know, almost adults, not children. I gotta make it clear that it is a demon child that targets Tia, but it's still not okay. Uh, no, I am not showing any of that. Back to more normal things like the anime, there's just too many things that bring it down and the few issues the manga has are very apparent. That's why, despite the manga being the go-to, I still wouldn't call it the definitive version. Both have a spark that is never fulfilled. Just Raikou messing with the panels gives you a glimpse of the potential the material has. Since you're able to take in the atmosphere and it's why it desperately needs a new anime, one that fully utilizes the best element of both. You do get a taste of that with the third opening having a much looser style with some pretty smooth animation. Thankfully, there's a more quality animated Dash Bell in the form of the movies, coming out one year apart, having no constraint and much tighter directing, looking great with very solid animation. They even redo some moments in the first movie, which doesn't sting in any way, shape, or form. Oh look, it's Sherry and Brago, and there they go. That's all that exists of them with movie budget. I'm more recommending this for fans of the series since they do have their own issues, but the visual upgrade is worth it. The first one wearing it on its sleeve that it's not canon. Some rules are broken, the world is shown, and ruins some of the writing in the manga. Also, it came out in 2004, which was this transitional period of Cell animation to digital. Yes, Satchfell was done on Cells. I was surprised too. The line work in the movie getting pretty jagged at times. Having some early 2000s CG as well as a moment were in effect glitch making the whole screen pixelated. This is for real in the movie, I am not kidding. Luckily, all these wrinkles would be ironed out for the second one, which is the fan favorite and I totally agree with that. Directed by Studio Bones bet Takuya Igarashi, who you know for Soul Eater, all of Bungo Stray Dogs, and Orin High School Host Club with key animation done by the legendary Sushio of Studio Trigger fame, Nishiturumi of Penguin Drum and Jojo Part 4 fame, and finally Katsuyoshi Nakatsuru, who has a long history with the Dragon Ball franchise. The quality of the movie matching that team having some great CG, animation, and character work, that despite there being little action in it, it's so entertaining. And this is what I mean, seeing someone bring their own thing when adapting it. From some really nice shots to little flourishes like how the text is black or the glow of the books. This is just scratching the surface of what's possible. And for the few that will argue that all of this is possible because it's a movie, similar to the first one it reanimates some scenes. But instead of being fights, it's this panel. While in the anime, it's literally incomplete. While here, it's so much better. It's small, but it shows what a really good director can do. Reminder that the plot for both is pretty dumb, so you're watching this for the visuals, not the writing. They did get a Blu-ray by Discotheque Media, which is what you're looking at, so it's pretty easy to get your hands on them. So I would suggest these after you finish a read of the manga, or in between the first two arcs. I think I've rambled long enough about the strengths and weaknesses of both, so I think it's time to get back to the manga. Battle Royales are just now in the public consciousness, everyone knows what it is, to the point that it's just a gimmick since there aren't a lot of them. Just being in the genre is what makes you interesting. But for Zatch Bell, it came out in 2001 where that was the opposite. Yeah, it's not the first, but it still wasn't something Raikou could bank off of, so it feels like he put a lot of effort to sell you on this crazy idea. At the moment, there's this big thing to find the next shonen series that really messes with the genre. And I find it funny since Zatch Bell did that 20 years ago. If it came out today, it would have been huge. It's the definition of being ahead of its time, and yet it's so forgotten that it's not even in the subgenre of Battle Royale. Which sucks because it's a really special series. Not for any one element we've talked about, but what happens when they all come together. And the best place to see this is one of my favorite fights. It's in the first third of the whole run, so I'm gonna say minor spoilers. But if you still want to skip, go to the time on screen. Pretty early on we meet Barry, a demon so strong that his battles leave him unsatisfied. To the point that he's always mad. His only way of relieving this frustration by fighting someone on his level. 
when his partner mentions of a powerful demon in Japan named Zatch, hearing that no one comes back after facing him. And this is a great moment because for the first time someone is acknowledging his strengths, that he's no longer the underdog. The thing is that he's passive and only fights when he needs to. That Barry gets mixed up when meeting him, with Zatch only agreeing to the fight since he threatens normal people. Barry for the first time excited. He takes an old building from some students and is willing to hurt them if they disagree until Zatch and Kyo arrive where the battle finally begins, with Kyo focusing on the leftover students and Zatch stalling, Barry forcefully regrouping them, going for his only leverage until he falters to Kyo, giving Zatch his window to save the girls. With now everyone evacuated, it makes them even matter, and with no distractions for the others, both parties are no longer holding back being pushed to their limit, using everything and doing anything to take each other out, that the building gets destroyed in the process. They finally use their ultimate spell, but he still stands. They're grasping at Strava at this point, but they still won't give up. Barry won, but he can't deliver the final blow, and he doesn't know why. It's here he learns Zatch's motivation, which he saw in his eyes. It's that conviction halting him because he lacks it. So he just leaves, forever changing them and their now rival. And here for me is what Zatch Bell is about. That a single battle can convey the struggle of life, and yet that's what makes it so beautiful. It's about facing the world and how it shapes us. From the tragedies, the bonds we form, to even the interactions big or small, and what we take away from those moments that make us who we are. How, at any point, we're gonna be asked if we want to continue to carry our beliefs or throw them away. How the bonds we have in those moments help us get through them and continue to push us toward our true selves. And that for me, ladies and gentlemen, is the genius of Zatch Bell. If you guys hit the end of the video, I always appreciate that, especially for these massive ones. I always hope they are worth the wait. But this end card is going to be a little different than usual because I got to give thanks to a bunch of people that help make the video as good as it is. First up is Zamir Stills for allowing me to use his dope ass Sonic Rush remix that you heard early on in the video. All of his stuff is just next level, so go give him a follow and listen to everything. It is totally worth your time. Next up is Aaron's Mind for allowing me to use a small portion of his Zatch Bell animation. So if you want to see more, it's all up on his YouTube channel and it's even part of a bigger Toonami collab that's on Newground. Both are really good, trust me. This video would be nothing without Janishi on Twitter. Because of them, I was able to get HD files of the entire manga. And without that, the video would be completely different. So give them a follow. They tweet about manga all the time and they are really freaking cool. And finally, DevDale on Twitter, who is this really awesome artist that makes a lot of cute Zatch Bell art. She is a massive Zatch Bell fan, so she was pretty much a writing consultant on this video. Answering any questions I had about the anime or manga, she was always ready to go and was really, really helpful. While also saving me a lot of time whenever I needed to find a specific image in the manga, she would always find it at the drop of a hat. Saved so much time. I, I can't thank you enough, DevDale. I know you're watching. If you're still here and want to watch more videos like this one, stay on the channel because I make them all the time or more whenever I have the time to do them. They take a lot of time. Hopefully you can tell. But... Here are two more just like it below, but as always, bye guys, thank you for watching, and I hope to see you in the next one.